Thank you to the commoners of the Ocean Federation for welcoming us to your spectacular home here on Mount Fuji. Thank you to the ISC organizers for bringing together the world's leading uh, common scholars and practitioners. It is a profound honor to speak with you today. I dedicate my remarks to Lynn Ostrom, our mentor, our teacher, and our friend, whose life and her work continues to inspire us all. She encouraged and shaped many of the ideas that I bring to you today. Distinguished commoners, ladies and gentlemen, my topic today is anti-commons theory and the hidden costs of lost innovation from poorly designed property rights. In a nutshell, my thesis is this. When too many people own pieces of one thing, nobody can use it. That's it, in one sentence. When too many people own pieces of one thing, nobody can use it. Usually, private ownership creates wealth. But too much ownership has the opposite effect. It creates what I call anti-commons tragedy. This is a free market paradox I discovered, and it shows up all across the global economy. If too many owners control a single resource, cooperation breaks down, wealth disappears, everybody loses. My presentation today proceeds in four steps. Uh, first, I discuss the commons. Uh, next, I present the core of anti-commons theory. Third, I show how the anti-commons illuminates a range of economic puzzles. And finally, time permitting, uh, I'll discuss a few uh, tentative solutions. Uh, I'm a very old-fashioned speaker, and I, I don't have uh, PowerPoints. Um, I wish I had uh, Taiko drummers behind me, but I do not even have that. So all I have is a, is a, a handout, uh, and you can follow along uh, on, on that. So let me start first with a little bit on the commons. So we have a familiar uh, understanding of what is the answer to what is property. Uh, property has long been seen as comprising three uh, distinct ideal types. A trilogy of private commons and state property. That's uh, figure one on the handout sheet. Commons, private, and state property. So for private property, uh, the most enduring uh, description or definition that we have is William Blackstone's image of soul and despotic dominion. Mm -hmm. A single autonomous decision maker who can exclude all others from some scarce resource and who can authoritatively um, direct the use of that resource. Second, we have state property. Here, for state property, resources are, in principle, answerable to the purposes of society as a whole, uh, rather than to any one individual's needs. So exactly how is it that societies choreograph uh, the dance of competing resource users on state or public lands? Uh, that's a complicated question. The functioning of state property has been much too little studied, I think, but it is outside the scope of today's talk. Um, third, we have commons property. And that will be my focus uh, for the next uh, few moments. The commons has been viewed as opposite to both private and state property. In the commons, there is no single authoritative decision maker. In principle, anyone may use a commons, no one may be excluded. So consider the familiar case where every shepherd may graze their sheep on a single common field. Each shepherd gets the full benefit from adding an extra sheep, but bears only a small share of the social cost the sheep imposes. As we know, as Garrett Hardin uh, named for us, the sum of these individual rational choices may be the field's destruction, a dilemma he captured in the tragedy of the commons image. So how do we avoid this tragic outcome? Traditionally, scholars have only seen two uh, directions for a solution. And I think the reason that we've only seen historically these two directions has to do with 
the power of uh, the power of language, in particular the power of that uh, trilogy uh, image. So one uh, approach, one solution for a trial to do the commons is to move in the direction of state control. Uh, but that has become a less and less favorite solution since socialism has fallen um, and command and control approaches to regulation have lost favor. So if state control is not a solution, what is left? And the old property trilogy suggests that the only answer to commons tragedy, the only answer is privatization. The only solution to conserving scarce, contested resources. And the reason is that in theory, uh, with the private property, there's a single owner who internalizes most of the external effects of any decision concerning resource use. You only add an extra sheep to the field, you only take a, a new fish out of the lake, um, if the benefit to you exceeds the cost to you um, from overgrazing or from depletion of the fish. That's the hidden conservation effect of private property. It was identified and discussed by a theorist named Harold uh, Demsitz. It's also the main justification for, for a utilitarian or for an economist when you say, why do we protect private property? The main answer is this utilitarian answer is the conservation engine that private property uh, provides. So until recently, <coughs> ownership, competition, markets, the very guts of capitalism have been understood through the extremes that are suggested by this old property trilogy. So you have private curing commons tragedy. You have capitalism uh, trouncing socialism. You have privatization beating regulation. You have market competition outperforming state control. But these simple dichotomies, these simple oppositions, mistake the standard types of ownership, the standard trilogy for the entire spectrum of ownership. And that framework, that trilogy, um, is fatally incomplete. Uh, one uh, way that is incomplete, one of the hidden costs of the common understanding of the property trilogy, of the tragedy of the commons image, is that it obscures resource management between commons and private. That was the great contribution that Lynn Oscar made. That's what the Nobel Committee awarded her the prize for, was for identifying the space and filling the gap for the space between commons and private. First, she helped us to distinguish uh, between what you might call open access on the one hand and group access on the other. That's uh, figure two on the handout sheet. So she separates commons property into open access, that is property where absolutely no one can be excluded at all. And as to open access property, tragedy really is uh, very hard to avoid, absent state coercion. Um, but that, it turns out that that problem, the problem of open access, is not so prevalent, except perhaps with problems like global warming and, and climate change. And there, that's the biggest resource dilemma of all, but it turns out that the second type of comments uh, group access on figure two, or what Professor Ons um, Ostrom called uh, common pool resources, is much more prevalent. It's prevalent everywhere in the world, and it's what, bring, it's what brings us to Kita Fuji uh, here today. Uh, so in a, in a group access uh, commons, or in a common pool resource, a limited number of commoners can exclude outside, outsiders, but they cannot exclude each other. So you can think of a common pool resource as private as to outsiders, but commons as to insiders. As Professor Ostrom showed, common pool resources are the predominant form of the commons, and they need not be tragic at all. Commoners, as she showed, often do cooperate, often do succeed in avoiding tragedy. And it was for this that she's most, uh, that the core of her contribution is adding to the familiar toolkit for solving resource tragedy, the familiar toolkit of privatization or state control, she said, let's look in a new place. Let's look in a third place. Let's look at commons-based solutions as well as private and state solutions. That was the great addition that she made. Um, her work uh, can and has been extended in many different directions, 
many of the scholars uh, working uh, uh, who are here today, this is a lot of what we do for a living, is uh, sort of in, in her shadow, think about extensions to uh, uh, commons uh, problems and commons uh, solutions. But her focus was primarily on uh, communitarian, um, extra-legal, outside the law, informal solutions to resource uh, dilemmas. Um, uh, one, uh, one area that I think her work perhaps underplay, and one area for many more scholarship today, is um, the creative role that law itself can play uh, between commons and private. So where she, where, where she calls group access resources common pool resources, um, I, uh, I call them uh, liberal commons resources. Uh, and the reason I call them this, call it liberal commons, is this. For me, a liberal commons is any regime, any property regime, in which a limited number of owners can capture the economic and the social benefits resulting from cooperative use of scarce resources. That's consistent with her work. But also, ensuring autonomy through a secure right to exit for people who want to leave. And it's that right to exit which is hard to accomplish, usually without law. So if you can think, for example, about marriage, um, or co-ownership, or partnerships, or trusts, or common interest communities, like condominiums, even corporations. These are all examples of commons property as well. These are examples of what I would call liberal common solutions to resource tragedy. These legal forms hold most of the world's wealth today, and they are the locus of much of our collaborative lives. So you think about a marriage, for example. Uh, a marriage, and, and property held in a marriage is common as to the spouses, neither can exclude the other, but private as to outsiders. And that same definition of commons applies to corporations and trusts and partnerships um, as well. Anyway, that's my next project, and this, this is not really today's topic. Um, uh, this is a book I'm working on called Law, Law for Utopia. We'll, we'll see if it works. Um, anyway, the, the point to note here is this. The point to note is that the old property trilogy hides a world of solutions, of communal solutions, of social solutions, of legal solutions um, to tragedy in the space between open access and private property. It's simply hard to see until you bring Lynn Ostrom's work into the picture. Um, but, the, but there's a second way um, that the old trilogy is misleading, and that's the core of my talk today um, on anti-commons theory. Um, the old trilogy suggests uh, that if some private property is good for wealth creation, or for resource conservation, or for personal autonomy, if some private property is good, then more privatization must be better. In this view, looking at the old trilogy, privatization can never go too far, you can't have too much. This understanding, I believe, has been a significant um, ideological factor in the worldwide push towards privatization. Um, all over the world in the last couple of decades. How do you solve commons resource dilemmas if you don't trust state control and you're not really focused on common solution? The only place you have left to go is privatization. So even when you add um, Lynn Ostrom's work and all of our work, you still only have part of the puzzle because you still have figure two. You still have open access and group access, but then you have the extreme of private property. You can't go beyond that. That still anchors the continuum. But it's not, it's, not, it's not right. Beyond private property, that's where we find uh, the anti-commons. Uh, before I define it, let me circle back to how I found it. Um, I first discovered uh, this form of ownership, anti-commons ownership, uh, with my forehead frozen uh, to a Moscow uh, shop window in 1991. Um, uh, the Soviet Union was crumbling. Um, I was uh, still the Soviet Union. I flew there, uh, for the, I was working for the World Bank at the time, and I stood on the podium uh, like this one, but the audience uh, was the Supreme Soviet. Um, behind me was a, a statue of Lenin, uh, red bunting. Uh, it was, a, it was um, uh, the, the, the talk then was um, how do you create uh, uh, private ownership? What is private property? So it was a very sort of, for a sort of question and answer uh, session for the Supreme Soviet on, on what is private property. And it turns out that destroying markets is much easier than uh, recreating them. There was a joke that, that went around in Russia at the time. Um, anyone can turn an aquarium into fish soup. The challenge is turning soup 
uh, back into fish. Um, at one point, the Minister of Finance um, asked, uh, asked me a, a question. He posed a puzzle for me. Um, he had privatized uh, storefronts um, a year earlier. He privatized stores, um, but the, sh the shelves were still empty. And on the streets, directly in front of the stores, uh, were kiosks that were absolutely full of goods. Anything you wanted to buy, you bought on a freezing kiosk on the street while the well-lit stores were empty. So I, I was looking in the stores trying to, trying to figure out why were the stores empty. And that was the question uh, the, the uh, minister asked me. Why are the stores empty even though they are privately owned? And what I discovered was that it was quite easy in, in Russia to set up a kiosk. You just uh, bribed a few local officials, uh, you paid uh, one mafia gang for protection, you never had to pay two, uh, they worked it out between them. Um, opening a store was far more difficult. When Russia privatized stores, they didn't say store one, this goes to owner A, store two goes to owner B, store three to owner C, this is figure three on the hand sheet. They did not do it that way. They did it in a very surprising way. They said, owner A, you have the right to sell store one. Owner B, you have the right to lease out store one. Owner C, you have the right to occupy store one. And what that meant was, with many competing owners of each store, stores remained empty. That was the answer. The answer was that nobody could set up shop without first collecting all the rights from all of the competing owners of the same resource. So I defined this phenomenon, this phenomenon of excessively fragmented ownership, as anti-commons tragedy. Anti-commons tragedy can be most easily understood as the mirror image of commons tragedy. A resource is prone to overuse in a tragedy of the commons when too many owners each have the privilege to use the resource and no one has the right to exclude any other. By contrast, a resource is prone to underuse in a tragedy of the anti-commons when too many owners each have the right to exclude others and no one has the ineffective privilege uh, to use the resource. Once an anti-commons emerges, collecting rights back into usable private property is brutal and slow. In Moscow, stores are opened uh, after many uh, drive-by shootings after many uh, hand grenades were tossed into stores uh, to kill competing owners. Uh, the process of collecting rights back into a usable bundle uh, took, took, a number of, took quite a number of years. In a world of costless transactions, in a wor the so-called world, Kosian world, although Ronald Kos is always doesn't like the way that, doesn't like that frame, but anything, in a Kosian world, uh, people could always avoid tragedy. They would just rearrange their, their rights. They would solve this automatically on both the commons and the anti-commons side. The problem is that, in reality, people face all kinds of act, um, uh, problems of collective action, of transaction costs, of identifying and bargaining and enforcing deals, of cognitive and psychological biases to deal-making. Uh, and those uh, biases and costs apply on the anti-commons side uh, as, as well as on the commons side. Uh, when, uh, the, when the Nobel laureate uh, James Buchanan, when he first modeled uh, my anti-commons construct, he showed that it was mathematically um, symmetrical to the commons as a formal matter. That anti-commons and commons were mathematically uh, uh, mirrors of each other. Um, but what has proven true since that, since he proved that, um, is that uh, more and more empirical economic and psychological studies are showing that solving anti-commons tragedies is even harder than solving the identical dilemma framed as a commons tragedy. This is not really a surprising finding, at least to me. Um, commons tragedies, like species extinction or air pollution, are relatively easy to see. You start coughing or there's no more fish. But anti-commons tragedies are often marked by things that are invisible, things that you can't see, innovation that is lost, uh, that is invisibly lost. 
Um, notice this is now figure four on the handout sheet. Notice what the Annie Commons uh, does to traditional ownership categories. Private property is not the end point of ownership. It is an optimum, a subtle optimum, poised between tragic extremes. From a social welfare standpoint, underuse in an anti-commons is just as costly, is just as wasteful, just as tragic as overuse in a commons. While we property scholars have always stressed the importance of clear entitlements, of clear rights, the anti-commons perspective suggests that we need to think as much about the scale and content of ownership as the clarity. For example, in Moscow, the property rights for owners A, B, and C were perfectly clear. They just weren't designed very well. One more distinction. Uh, just as we now distinguish on the common side between open access and group access, similarly, we need to distinguish on the anti-common side between uh, full exclusion, which is the parallel to open access, and anti-commons property so-called, which is the parallel to commons property or common pool resources. And that gets us to figure five in the last figure on the handout sheet. With open access and full exclusion, state coercion is likely the only solution. But with core commons and anti-commons ownership, we can look to a very rich array of informal, social, norm-driven, and legal solutions to create successful governance of scarce uh, resources. Private property is a very hardy institution. That was one of the telling moments working in the, in the former Soviet uh, countries. Private property is a very hardy solution. Uh, but it's one that's vulnerable to uh, the initial allocations and the initial entitlements of property, and it's also very vulnerable to later mismatches between the uh, scale of ownership and the socially desired uses of resources. What the anti-commons concept does is make visible half, the hidden half, of our ownership spectrum. And it also, I think, I hope, um, upends some of our core intuitions about private property. Private property is no, long, no longer the end point of ownership. It's a hard-fought balance between the extremes of commons and anti-commons, and between the dangers of overuse and the dangers of underuse. Uh, privatization, it turns out, can go too far. And when privatization goes too far, it destroys rather than creates wealth. Making anti-commons ownership visible is not so easy. Uh, empty Moscow storefronts are one example. Here's one other image that may be, uh, that, that has helped me. Um, a thousand years ago on the Rhine River, this was one of the world's greatest trade routes. Boat, uh, boat uh, men traded under the protection of the Holy Roman Emperor for a thousand years. This is European trade was driven uh, substantially by trade on the Rhine. When the emperor weakened in the 13th century, freelance German barons uh, built castles, uh, stretched chains across the river, and collected their own um, private tolls. Uh, this growing uh, gauntlet of robber baron castles, there were over 200 at one point, made shipping impossible. So for 500 years, the Rhine continued to flow, but there was no trade. Trade simply disappeared as the number of veto points, the number of choke points, the number of owners uh, increased. Everyone suffered, even the robber barons. The European economic pie shrank. Wealth disappeared. Too many tolls meant too little trade. So to understand the anti-commons, you just update this image. Toll booths can emerge wherever ownership first is created, and property is being created all the time in ways that many of us don't realize, especially um, on, in the internet world. Um, today's robber barons are often state planners and regulators, 
each with a choke point and some decision process. Today's missing river trade can take the form of crushed entrepreneurial energy or lost investment. When there are too many public decision makers or too many private owners on the path to some uh, valuable resource use, uh, we all lose. Now, Rhine voters and empty Moscow stores are very esoteric examples. But there are a near infinity of everyday uh, examples that share the same analytic structure. One whose solution could jumpstart innovation and release trillions in productivity, and I believe help revive the global economy. I want to just briefly touch um, on uh, five contemporary puzzles. I'm very mindful of the time. I recognize that I am all that stands between <laughs> you and a uh, tour of the uh, Mount, uh, Mount Fuji region, so I will be very careful to observe the time. <laughs> Um, okay, so let me start with one example, which is the example of uh, drugs. Um, drugs. And this is a life or death example. When I first started presenting this research, the CEO of one of the world's uh, major drug companies contacted me and said, um, you have uh, identified uh, the problem for our, our Alzheimer's research. Uh, we're, pretty, we're fairly confident that we've discovered a major advance in Al Alzheimer's uh, uh, treatment. Major, maybe not a cure, but a major advance. Um, but the problem is that we can't test this drug without getting access to dozens of patents. Dozens of patents, in this case it was regarding neurotransmitters in the brain um, along which their, uh, uh, that their drug might affect. So imagine the drug developer um, walking into an auditorium like this one. And imagine that each one of you owns a patent. Each one of you owns a patent that he needs in order to test his drug. And unless he can negotiate with every single one of you, if, any, if a single one of you says no, the, the, his drug research cannot go forward. But each of you believes, each of you is a scientist with a small company, each of you believes that your single neurotransmitter, your single patent, is the most important one. And each one of you demands a corresponding price. and the deal failed. Uh, the drug maker couldn't negotiate all of those patent rights. There were just too many, they were too valuable, they were, it was too complicated to make a deal. So he walked away and he showed the drug, he didn't develop the drug, uh, even though it could have saved countless lives and potentially earned his company many billions of dollars. And that was just one isolated example, but there are many. In the last 30 years in the world, uh, drug research and development investment has been going steadily up. But the number of classes of major new drugs, the drug discoveries that really make a difference, has been going steadily down. How did that new drug discovery gap occur? I think a substantial answer to that question is anti commons tragedy. Paradoxically, more biotech patent owners means, or can mean, fewer life-saving inventions and innovations. Drugs that should exist, that could exist, don't get created. And they don't get created invisibly, right? Who knows to protest for a drug that hasn't come into being? What's difficult about anti commons tragedy is the innovations that don't come into existence. Mm -hmm. It's not the smoke in the air, it's the missing Alzheimer's drug that nobody knows to protest. But it's not just drugs that are missing because of misspecified property rights. The same dilemma appears in the copyright realm. And let me just give you one example, but there are thousands and thousands of examples I could give you, but here's one um, that, that for me was fairly salient. Um, 25 years ago, Henry Hampton, who's a very well-known documentary filmmaker, uh, created a movie called Eyes on the Prize. This was a documentary about the life of the civil rights leader, Dr. Martin Luther King. And in that film, he used video clips from 80 archives. He used 300 photos from 90 archives. He used clips from 120 different songs. He was able to air the broadcast once, and then the film was locked away. He couldn't rebroadcast it again. 
he couldn't release it on DVD because he didn't have the rights for a DVD release or rebroadcasting. And it would have taken negotiations with 500 owners of music clips, film clips, TV clips, and so on to put the DVD of the movie out. So the most important film account of the American Civil Rights Movement disappeared. And it disappeared because of anti-communist tragedy. Too many owners and too little ability to uh, uh, make, in many cases, documentary films or to show them again. If, for those of you who are, follow rap music, rap music used to sample many different types of songs in one rap song. They can't do that anymore because of copyright anti communist tragedy. So for those of you who care about the evolution of rap music, this is also a major uh, anti communist tragedy. Here's a third, a third example, and a very high stakes one. Um, let me ask, frame it as a question. What is the most underused resource in the world? What is the most underused natural resource? I believe the answer is the airwaves, is a uh, spectrum. Uh, in America, for example, over 90% of spectrum of the airwaves is dead air, is completely unused, uh, because broadcast spectrum is so fragmented and restricted. Uh, the United States created thousands of owners with geographically limited licenses, limited to specific uh, technological uses, uh, with limitations on resale. And what that meant in America is that assembling spectrum for high-speed national wireless was extremely costly and difficult. And the effect of that is that spectrum use in America lags far behind, for example, Japan's. So 20 years ago, America was one of the technological innovators and leaders in spectrum capacity and in, in broadband use and capacity. And now, it's almost out of the top 20 countries internationally. And that's a purely self-inflicted loss from the telecom anti commons tragedy. Uh, so for, for those of you who, when you travel from Japan to the US, you, you may know how much slower your phones work in the US and how much less capable they are. And that's just an artifact of anti-commons tragedy, of a spectrum anti-commons. The loss to the US economy from spectrum anti-commons measures in the trillions of dollars. It was a, just a stupid way to create property rights. But a one that was created because people were not aware of the anti-commons implications. Uh, fourth, I want a fourth example and, um, uh, is the current financial crisis, so the one that started five years ago. That was largely also a result of poorly designed property rights in mortgages. Mm -hmm. um, it used to be the case that you knew your mortgage banker. You had someone to talk to if things went wrong. There was somebody to call if you needed to renegotiate your mortgage. Now, loans are put into big pools, cut up into tranches, sold as derivatives, and owned by thousands of globally dispersed investors. So if your individual home, if you get in trouble in your individual home, who do you call? In a world with globally traded derivatives, there is literally no one you can call. So when the mortgage foreclosure, the mortgage start, when, when the mortgage foreclosure crisis started, there was really no mechanism in securitization, in the world of securitizations, to stop the crisis. And that was largely an artifact of the anti-commons design of property rights in mortgage securities. So unwinding the global financial crisis has been much more costly and much more painful than it need be, solely because we created a structure of ownership of mortgages that did not take into account the costs of later renegotiations, that is the cost of potential anti-commons tragedy. One last example. That's maybe a little more down to earth. Uh, all of us, maybe some of us today, have spent uh, uh, lots of our lives uh, stuck in airports. And why is that? And it, it's not necessary. Um, in the last couple decades, air travel around the world has absolutely taken off. Uh, but construction of new airports, and particularly new runways, has not kept up. Um, in, in the United States, uh, if we built 25 runways, 
not 30 runways, 25 runways in the U.S. would end routine air travel delays. Completely. Gone. You simply wouldn't wait. Uh, you would not wait around. Um, but you can't build a new runway or a new airport, almost anywhere, because multiple land owners can and do block every project. The saga, the sad saga of the Narita uh, runway expansion uh, is illustrative as well. By blocking land assembly for decades, a very small number of property owners imposed quite a large cost on Japan's international competitiveness. Japan, like the United States, lacks good tools to assemble land for economic development. Not just for airports, but for ordinary large-scale residential, commercial, industrial uh, development. Private voluntary assembly is painfully slow and costly. Eminent domain, which is our only other alternative, is often capricious, is often undercompensatory, and is often unfair. People hate it. Um, but those are the only tools we have. Viewing land assembly and development through the anti-commons prism can point us to some solutions. My goal in mentioning these five different areas, these five different puzzles, is, to, is to, just, just to say one thing, that this free market paradox is nothing fancy. It is all around us once you start to look. All of these problems are really the same problem. Private ownership usually creates wealth, but too much ownership creates anti-commons tragedy and blocks innovation. There's been an unnoticed revolution in how the world creates wealth. A generation ago, you secured a patent and marketed a product. You copyrighted your music and you sang a song. You subdivided land and you built houses. But that is the old economy. Today, the leading edge of wealth creation requires assembly. Drugs, telecom, software, semiconductors, banking, anything high tech requires the assembly of innumerable patents. Your cell phones, uh, one cell phone has several thousand patents that write on it. And every cell phone uh, that, that you, every one of your cell phones violates dozens or hundreds of patents. It's not just high tech that's changed. The cutting edge of film, the cutting edge of music is all about mashing up and remixing many bits of copyrighted culture. And even with land, the most socially important projects like new runways or economic development generally we require the assembly of multiple parcels. So innovation has moved on, but we are stuck with ownership that's easy to break up, that's easy to fragment, and very hard uh, to put back together. Rather than waste their time and money dealing with anti-commons ownership, many of the world's most powerful businesses, like the drug company executive I told you about, they simply redirect their investment towards less challenging areas. They have extensions of existing drugs or existing products. And by doing that, by simply moving away from new areas, they let innovation slip away. And again, it slips away invisibly. But this debacle has a flip side. Assembling fragmented property is one of the great entrepreneurial and legal reform challenges of our time. We can reclaim that wealth. Uh, so I have a few words um, on solutions, but they are very few, as the time is short. But anyway, let me, let me just mention a few, a few solutions. So the flip side of Andy Cummins' tragedy is entrepreneurial and social activism opportunities. Innovators can get rich by getting good at assembling uh, ownership fragments. So the reason you have a DVD or a JPEG, the reason you, have, you can watch movies um, work in any uh, any player, uh, is because patent owners voluntarily pooled their patents. So for example, the DVD patent pool combines over 700 voluntary uh, patents into one pool that makes it possible for DVDs to work. 
because of collecting societies, which each country has, uh, like ASCAP in the US or BMI, every country has a different one, you can hear music on the radio. Each radio uh, disc jockey uh, doesn't negotiate with every musician. It's an intermediary uh, that, does, that's, oh, that solves the anti communist problem. Um, there's also uh, philanthropic uh, uh, solutions out there. So for example, you have uh, corporations donating patents uh, for malaria research, for example, um, where there's very little potential financial reward, but great uh, humanitarian rewards. So one solution is entrepreneurial and social and philanthropic, individual solutions. Um, a second category of solution has to do with legal reforms. Um, so in, in another scholarship on, on the land problem, um, I proposed, for example, something called land assembly districts, uh, similar to land adjustment uh, here. Uh, voluntary deals rarely work for assembly, eminent domain people hate, um, but there are fairly simple legal tweaks uh, that we could put in place that would make assembling land uh, both more efficient uh, and more fair, if, if we chose to do that. Uh, similarly, um, in the world of patent law, uh, there are fairly simple tweaks that we can make once you identify the problem, uh, fairly simple uh, legal solutions that you can make to make it easier, for example, to challenge low quality patents or to change the remedies for violations for infringing patents. Fixing anti commons tragedies, I think, is going to be one of the key uh, challenges for our time, as, as scholars, but also as activists, uh, entrepreneurs, um, practitioners. What I want to stress to you, I think, is that the first, the most important step to solving the anti commons is to, to name it and to make it visible. With the right language, we can all spot links among ownership puzzles and come together to fix them. There's nothing inevitable about any anti-commons. Every ownership puzzle, every one of them that I mentioned, results from choices that we make and choices that we can change about how we structure our relationship and control of the resources that we value the most. Thank you very much for your attention.